Hello, welcome to another episode of Test, Optimize, and Scale. It is a privilege to have Jody Grundon here with us today, author, accounting visionary, uh, co-founder of Summit Virtual CFO by Anders, going to be talking about subscription-based billing methods, going to be talking about Jody's books, Digital Dollars and Cents, and building the virtual CFO firm in the cloud. Jody, pleasure to have you on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jason. Appreciate it. And Jody, love talking about the world of finance, world of accounting, the numbers behind a startup, behind entrepreneurship, behind growth of organizations of all different sizes. Mm -hmm. So looking forward to getting into it with you here, but thought we'd start with your background and and your story into the creation of of your organization. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, I can start even before that. I uh, went to uh, school to be an accountant and I realized pretty quickly uh, working in a public accounting firm, that wasn't for me. I didn't want to wasn't I didn't want to work the hours. It just I it just didn't give me the, the the ability to to raise a family, coach my kids, all that kind of stuff. And so I thought, you know, hey, the corporate world would be even better. So I thought, hey, let's make that switch. Go to the corporate world. Work for a large uh, manufacturing company, two hundred fifty million dollar manufacturing company. And it was great for that first year. Then it was Groundhog Day ever since. You know, it was like one. It was just re- rinse and repeat. And it was like, wow, I need something more challenging. And so I thought the entrepreneur part of me thought, hey, let's uh, let's do something different and let's start a uh, an accounting firm, and you know, I thought well, I can do it differently than everyone else, and and realized uh, right away that it's very difficult changing a mold of something that's been established for for such a, a long period of time, which is the accounting firm, you know, per se. But I wanted to do things a lot differently. I wanted to get rid of the the billable hour. I wanted to get rid of working a busy season, which you know during a tax season we would typically work you know fifty to 60, 70 hours a week from January through. April, then it would level off after that, but it was a real burnout type of type of feeling. I wanted to dress differently than what a typical accountant did 20 years ago and they had suits and ties all the time. You just do do things a lot differently from you know every aspect. And uh, so that's where I did. I started uh, Summit. I thought, hey, let's let's change the world here. Let's change the way people think about accounting completely. And I hired my uh, now uh, uh, partner, well, partner at the time, uh, right out of college, he's my very first hire, and uh, we uh, went from there and uh, just started doing things differently. Uh, created a a virtual CFO model, which um, at that time didn't didn't exist. Uh, the top, the idea didn't exist. The concept was probably there. The internet really wasn't going very strong, so it wasn't. It was hard to find you know people out there that were doing what we were doing. And uh, we uh, thought, you know, hey, let's let's do things differently and look forward, meaning that a lot of accountants will look backwards. And, you know, they'll talk about the historical financial statements and how they did and, and that sort of thing. And we thought, hey, that's kind of boring. Uh, most clients don't like to hear it and most clients you know, don't have time for it. And so we thought, you know, let's make it so that they're interesting and they love coming to the meetings with us. So we thought, hey, let's uh, let's talk about the future all the time. And so we. We spent about 15 minutes recapping the past. And then from there on, we were like, you know, hey, based on that, here's what your cash position is going to look like in six months or 12 months, or here's what your revenue is going to look like. And oh, by the way, here's what your tax position is going to look like. And so our clients were super informed. And the, the cool thing about it is they they felt they had control over their finances for probably the first time ever. You know, when you think about it, all these big companies have, you know, a bunch of us in there, whereas they did not have that. They're an accidental owner for the most time, m- m- most cases. And and this was something very new to them, and they thought this is pretty cool. And so we, we we really started focusing in on that vertical where we thought, you know, hey, we're going to provide virtual CFO services for everybody. This is going to be great. We're going to scale. It's going to be awesome. And we found out that nobody knew what it was. <laughs> so it was, it was very difficult to scale a concept that wasn't even out there. And uh, we picked up about four to six clients a year. We thought, wow, this is this is horrible. <laughs> you know, this this is going to be the slowest growing you know, thing we've ever done. And, um, you know, so we, we, we thought, well, how are we going to get the word out? So we did content marketing and really kind of blew it up. And, and, uh, that, at that time, again, nobody was parking on the internet. Everybody was doing the, the old phone book. If you remember what that even was. And uh, that was where you spent your marketing dollars. And, and with us, I thought, well, I didn't have the money to spend on the phone book. Cause I was just a brand new entrepreneur startups, you know, you know basically bootstrapped everything ourselves. And I thought, well, let's put this in this really cheap <laughs> inexpensive vehicle called the internet and uh we did we we just started flooding content and and um we were blogging every day and we've been blogging every day from probably 2005 2006 until 
you know, just recently. And so that's a lot of content out there. And, and when I say blogging, that's articles and, you know, short articles, you know, blogs, you, you name it, videos now and, and uh, you know, all the different kinds of social media. So we really kind of really focus our energy on that. And uh, now anytime you type in, you know, like virtual CFO services anywhere in the, in the nation, we're going to come up on that first page, one, two or three, which is kind of kind of cool. And it's because we've been doing it forever. And, and it really kind of on the organic site, it's been really kind of a fun, fun ride. Uh, so much so that we kind of doubled our size every three years from probably 2010 uh, on and grew it from under a million dollars back then to uh, a little over $10 million. And that's when we uh, merged in with a, another accounting firm back in uh, April called Anders CPA Advisors. And it's kind of hence the name, you know, vir some virtual CFO by Anders and to become their virtual CFO arm. And so we uh, stayed as a unit marketing and everything together. And we are now uh, trying to grow up at a five multiple from you know 10 million to 50 million over the next uh, four years and and so far we're on track we'll we'll do about 15 million this year and looks like it's uh, going to continue that high growth pace and so super excited for the future and uh, you know it's one of those things that when you get when you grow your your baby and, and then you finally and then sell it then it's like that little you know that stomach thing it's like oh my gosh what did I just do what's my life going to be that I just, you know, is my life over now, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. And, and, uh, you know, with that, I, I, it's kind of cool because it's nice and rejuvenating that now, Hey, we've got a, even a bigger goal than what we would have had before. And this could be a great win situation for everybody. If we can get to that $50 million mark, you know, over the next three and a half, four years. And so super excited for the future. And I know that was kind of a, a, a long answer to a short question, but I thought I'd give you a lot, that little background. Yeah, that was the perfect storyline. And I always say the only way to measure is with numbers. Hearing you talk about the growth from 1 million to 10 million back in the, you know, four to six new clients a year days. Want, want to speak to you more about content marketing and yeah. Batman in 05, 06, and how you guys are ranking now, how it, you know, came to fruition. Uh, and then hearing about M&A activity, mm -hmm. mergers and acquisitions, and it's part of the exit strategy of so many of the business plans that we're a part of. So the fact that you've, you've lived it, you've gone down that path, you've felt the emotions of what did mm -hmm. I just do and what, what are the next chapters look like? And mm -hmm. now, you know, combined forces to be go, uh, going after this much larger goal, 50 million. Imagine the multiples are pretty exciting at that point yeah. as well, too. A lot mm -hmm. of discussions around that. Um, but but. Before we get into the content, before we talk too much more uh, about you know end game and exit strategy, I want to take it back to numbers. I want to take it back to to metrics. Yeah, because yeah. You talked about the foundation. You started mm -hmm. with more of a corporate background, created a firm that that you wanted to work with, and therefore mm -hmm. work as you know with these other groups. Uh, different, not necessarily the suit and tie. Hey, let's spend a little bit of time on the past. Let's move to the future. Let's get to the exciting stuff. The planning. Mm -hmm. How do you determine the metrics? I, I know there's different pillars of metrics that that you point towards directly. Mm -hmm. How can founders listening in? How can any group? I mean, it's a VC firm, and they're just trying to figure out how to map things out here in 2023. What metrics are most meaningful to you a, a, as a virtual CFO? Yeah, good, great question. Because you know, but with the uh, with the virtual CFO, we're very different than a traditional accounting firm in that uh, we're 100 subscription based, and so. Uh, we don't bill by the hour. So hours are not our metric, you know, so average bill rate, not our metric at all. It's kind of a, it's kind of a back end metric to see what our efficiencies are, but it's not a metric that we drive a forecast with. And so we're looking at, you know, we're, we're looking at how many clients we're picking up. So frequency of clients, we're, we're looking at the velocity of those clients. We're looking at the size of the client, you know, and so we, we know that, Hey, on average, you know, I talk about four to six clients a year, we're picking up between four to six clients a month right now. And we've been, and, and, and that's grown about a client a month more every single year. So like, you know, last year was like three to three and a half. Now it's four to four and a half, you know, on the average and, you know, as high as, you know, as low as three and as high as seven or eight clients in a month. And we know that our average clients about uh, $82,000 is what our average client, uh, you know, fee for our client is. And again, spread out over, over 12 months. And so we're actually over 52 weeks because we, we bill weekly. We don't even, we don't even invoice clients. We just zap their account kind of like Netflix, but we do it weekly instead of monthly. So if Net, Netflix is out there, it's a great idea. Weekly, not monthly, um, helps cash flow for sure. And uh, it, it's, it's great for clients. So we, you know, th th those are kind of the metrics that we look at. Now, cash is a huge part of it. And we talk about cash with all of our clients. And we say that you need two to six months of cash 
on hand at really any time. Any time. And, and the easy calculation for a service-based business, which would be like for a marketing firm, law firm, accounting firm, you name it, is about 10% of your annualized revenue. That's about two months worth of expenses. And if you look at um, you know up to 30% of your cash, that's going to be about six months of expenses. And so you're, you're looking at a quick multiple in your head, you know, hey, I can do it. I'm a $10 million firm, so I need a million dollars minimum in the bank. And that just covers, you know, regular stuff. And then 30%, if I'm doing some other things, a high risk, maybe I'm concentrating on a bigger client, like maybe one client's majority of my business or something like that, or or I've got a high vendor relationship or if a vendor goes out, I'm going to be stuck for a little bit. You know, so there's a lot of different factors that go into if you want 10 or 30%, uh, 30%, again, low risk, 10%, a little bit higher risk. Um, if you're subscription based, then you're going to want close to that 10% because you don't have an, you don't have a uh, risk for invoicing and AR and all that kind of stuff. And so we, we knew that, hey, if we can, if we can keep that 10% build and grow our company and, and, and maintain a 15 to 25% bottom line, uh, we knew that uh, that was going to attract some really uh, big, you know, big clients when we get to that 10 to, to $20 million mark. And so that was kind of our goal or our structure all along was, hey, looking at the end game, knowing that, hey, we had really no interest in selling. We're doing great. We're making tons of money. Uh, so there's no no reason for us to sell. Um, but we wanted to make sure that, hey, as we grow this thing, we just didn't zap all the money out of the bottom of it and make it look like a bad company. We wanted it to look very appetizing so that in the event that that, that one company did come along, that was the perfect scenario for us, then we were ready to go and we were able to get that highest multiple. So you know, the, 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 I, I'd say the key that I would recommend is finding out what that high multiple is for the industry. You know, what, is, what does your industry look like? Do they want you to have a 20% bottom line and do they want you to have, do they care if you have cash in the bank? Maybe they don't even care. That's perfectly fine. Or, or maybe that it's a 10% bottom line, and, but your salary can't be the majority of that. Or, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. And I, I think it's really important to figure out whatever industry you're in to figure out what that end game looks like and how can you achieve that highest multiple? Do they look at growth? Most people look at growth in, in EBITDA, you know, growth and bottom line, you know, and, and you know, are those the, the two things? Maybe they will base it on a top line. Maybe it's more subscription based or, you know, where, they, where they're only looking at top line and they don't care, care too much about bottom line. But be careful because, I was just talking to an accounting firm that was subscription based and and they were valuing everything on the top line. So they're putting all their money in that top line, building that infrastructure so they can really grow, spending all the money they could on employees, building it up. And then to find out that the market changed and they said, you know, top line is not what we're looking at anymore. We're looking at the bottom line. So their valuation went from way high to hardly anything at all, just like that. And uh, that's a tough one to recover from. You know, it's a tough one that if you built that business based on, a certain metric or a certain, you know, pace and a certain, you know, employee count and all that kind of stuff. And you've got to make that change overnight because your value just completely changed. Um, it's important to understand what that is and, and just be careful when you're doing it. So again, another long answer, but, you know, I, I'd say making sure you at least have that 10 to 30% of your annualized revenue in the bank at all times. That's the big, that's the big cash thing. That's what makes the world go around that. That allows you to take a risk. You know, that allows you to hire that business development person that you really didn't need, but man, she was awesome. And you wanted to bring her onto the team, you know, that type of thing, you know, that, that allows you to do that type of type of thing. Cause you know, like, like I can give you two scenarios where, you know, same company approached me in two different times in their, in their career, where maybe one doesn't have cash and one doesn't, I would say hire that business development person. If you got 30% in the bank. And I would say, don't even think about it. If you don't have at least 10%, you know, that, so, so it, it, it's the same person, same situation. The only difference is, uh, a cash. And so cash is king. Are there more costs for having that 30% around when it comes to taxes, when it comes mm -hmm. to holding that capital? And I, I just love the way this is planned out from the beginning. Like you said, that end game in mind, know your numbers now, D don't start figuring it out later. Once people start coming to your door, asking to buy you, and then you're working backwards as mm -hmm. much as knowing your top line, your bottom line, where it needs to be, for me, how it can grow and filling in the gaps there. As you said, we went from four to six clients, uh, you know, a year, four to six clients a month. Here's my, you know, average revenue per client per year. Here's how we stack things up. Here's how we determine where the percentages are. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, 30% sounds pretty nice in terms yes. of the peace of mind. Are, mm -hmm. are there other costs or obstacles that come along with that? 
Oh, for sure. It, it's not, I mean, 30% uh, it is very tough to do because you got to be super disciplined, right? So you've got to make sure that, hey, you're, you're, you're doing everything to build that, uh, build that business as efficient as you can, but not hurting the business as you're growing it. And, and a lot of times that 30% comes out of the owner's uh, owner's pocket for the most part, you know? So, you know, it, it could be that the owner needs to take a little bit less for a few years to build that up. If that, if that's, if 30% is their number, our average client keeps about 18% in the bank. So our average client's not at 30%, you know, they're not at 10. They're kind of like right there in the middle type of thing. And so you have to kind of figure out what you need to do. Now, keep in mind, you're going to pay tax on that money, um, at least for that, you know, on that, on that, that difference there. So keep that in mind too, which, you know, the, you know, the, the biggest KPI you could ever have or the most valuable KPI is really uh, taxes. If you're, if you're, KP, if you're paying a lot of taxes, I mean, you're making a lot of money. And so you don't want to pay, you know, oh, you don't want to pay too much, obviously, but, uh, but keep that in mind. So that's not a bad KPI at all. And that's something that, that I relish. It's like, wow, this is kind of cool. It's like a badge of honor uh, that I was able to do that the lowest dollar amount possible, but, you know, still being, you know, still being there. Cause I know that I'm building cash in the process. And so, you know, that, that that's probably the biggest thing, you know, there and, and keep in mind that you, you've got, you know, as you're building that cash, you know, the, it's there for security of your company. You know, it's not there to showboat. It's not there for anything but to secure your company. Cause when you build, when you have a, a company of 10 people, you know, that that's, you, you got 10, 10 folks there, you know, they've got families. So you're probably talking, you're affecting maybe 25 to 30 people. When you've got a company of 50 people, you know, that, that number is huge now. And, and the worst case thing that I would, would want as an owner or would keep me up at night as an owner would be to make a bad decision. And then, you know, two weeks from now, I'm letting go half my team because I made a dumb, dumb mistake. Whereas with cash in the bank, building it up, if I make a dumb mistake, it's a dumb mistake. It's not going to kill our business. It's just going to then set me back a little bit on the cash where then I need to build it back up. And so it's a completely different ball game when you've got cash in the bank. And it's it's really for that security of your team. And so that, that's how I look at it. As a stewardship, you know, I want to make sure that my team is secure. You know, I don't want I don't want to be selfish in the process, pull everything out. And then find out later that uh, that that was not the, the, the prudent thing to do. Sure. And we get so many question marks from the founders that we work with around the economic state here in 2023, 2022. What's mm-hmm. going on? No one knows, of course. Uh, so I'm all about that security as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, under capitalization leads to startups, small businesses going under. So having that security yeah. there. I've heard of other approaches, you know, discretionary owners bonuses, things like that, uh, you know, outside of salary. But I, I, I really like that recommendation of more of the 30 percent, 10 to 30 percent, of course. Great. Mm-hmm. You're talking about comparables for the industries. Mm-hmm. How, how do you go about finding that t- type of information? Because I, I think it's perfect. It's like you said, we knew for our space what we were changing. How do you go about that for different verticals, especially what I find in startup land is businesses often fit into to multiple verticals. Mm-hmm. So right. we're a SaaS company for this industry. And then you can look at the comparables for both. Uh, I always find stats on the marketing side that are applicable to the model that, that groups are not aware of. I imagine it's the same on the accounting and valuations. Mm-hmm. What's the best way to go about finding that type of industry metric? Yeah, the, the, we use um, different software programs for that. Plus, the fact that we have a high concentration in marketing firms. Because one thing I didn't mention is we we niched in about 2011 to marketing firms, and so we've got probably 80, 70 to 80 marketing firms that we have actually on our um, that we do you know CFO work for, and so we actually know that information pretty intimate. And so that's that's one thing is to find a provider that's niched into the space that you're looking for. If it's cannabis, then Hopefully they've got, you know, several cannabis firms if it's construction, so forth, marketing, you name it. Um, we use a uh, product called Profit Sense for, um, th- to come up with exactly the, the numbers that we're looking for. It's uh, profit with a you know, sense with a C and, and that's where we find our information. But there's a lot of different places out there on the internet that you can actually do some, you know, searches for to come up with industry averages. And again, you're, you're looking for industry averages only to compare yourself to the industry in the, in the matter that, Am I in the right ballpark? You know, you should always be creating a solid dynamic forecast and, and truly comparing yourself against that forecast first and foremost. Industry is just there to kind of look 
is my forecast reasonable? You know, because you can create a, a really cool forecast. You're going to be rich in three years and you find out, well, a typical marketing firm doesn't have a 50% bottom line, <laughs> you know, that, that type of thing. And, you know, well, no wonder I got all these expenses outside of that. So it, that, that's where the, uh, the industry averages come up to kind of true things up to make sure that you're in the right ballpark there. Uh, but the dynamic forecast is really the key. You'd mentioned, you know, recessionary possibilities or whatever, or going back to the pandemic, you know, the, the feeling there is like, wow, the future is not as certain as what I thought it was. And that's where the forecasting really plays a big part of it. And when I when I say forecasting, I truly mean dynamically. And so what a dynamic forecast is going to do is going to be based on non-financial indicators, things that you can control, like people or product or you know, service. Like I mentioned that I, I'm subscription-based, so we're looking at number of clients we pick up, number of clients we lose. We're looking at the average order size of a client and the frequency. You know, So those, those are my, my non-financial drivers to this, this forecast. And so you have to kind of identify what are your non-financial drivers? And so then as you do that, you build your forecast and you build it based on non-financials, you flip them to financials. So you can kind of see, hey, what, what, what does, you know, what, what does that actually accumulate to? Do I, am I supposed to have $100,000 January, a $200,000 February, you know, cause I'm basing it on maybe days in the month or how, whatever I'm doing, it's truly dynamic based over a period of time. And so then what happens is when you, when you go through, every single month and you kind of match up what truly did happen, then you can make adjustments to it. You know, Hey, my, my dynamic forecast said I was going to, you know, I'm a trucking company and I you know, maybe a truck repair company and I'm bringing in 10 trucks and, you know, now all of a sudden my, my inventory is getting low. So now I'm only bringing five trucks. Well, is that going to be a short-term thing or is that a long-term thing? And you can make those adjustments if it's long-term so you can bring your forecast down. And so th th that's where the modeling really comes into play. Cause we had, tons of agencies that we, we, we meet with them on a weekly basis. And we're going through modeling and that sort of thing. There was times where we meet with them two, three times a week because they'd come to us and say, you know what, uh, this big client put us on hold for, you know, possibly three months, you know, you know we're waiting. How's that going to impact things? Do I have to lay people off? You know, what happens if they come back? You know, I, I need a runway to bring those people back or, you know, who do I, you know, how do I lay off? I lay off 10 people, you know, all those different questions were coming during that thing. And the only reason we could actually answer those it's because we had that solid forecast in place. If we didn't have it in place, we would be just shooting in the dark and, and just guessing kind of like everyone else guessed at that point. Uh, whereas with, with the uh, forecast, it allowed us to really make that informed decision, you know, based on logic and not based on just simply emotions. And that's, that's, that was key to getting a lot of those folks through uh, such a, a bad situation. And, you know, and I say going forward now, recessions typically that last, what, you know, maybe 15 months, you know, tops. And so, you know, making sure that you've got that four, you know, I say tops, you know, it could last a little bit longer, but I'd say on average between, you know, eight to eight to 15 months. And so you're looking at, you know, hey, how can I get myself through a bad situation for eight to 15 months? Well, I've got my cash, you know, the bank. So I got, and I also have a line of credit possibly. Uh, you should always have at least uh, a line of credit equal to that 10 to 30%. So if you got 10%, is your line is what you're looking at? Maybe you're a million dollar company. You have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Your line of credit should be roughly a hundred thousand dollars. So that you've got a, kind of like a double double option there. I'd always and I'd always renew a line of credit over two years, not one. And so when you go to renew the line of credit, say, hey, I'd like to pay the extra hundred hundred bucks or whatever, and, and and have it renew every two years. And reason every two years because again that recessionary period eight. Uh, 15 months, it's going to fall within that two-year period. You're not going to have to apply for a line of credit or have your line of credit called uh, during a time that there'd be no way for you to actually, you know, have the, the ability to actually exercise that. And so um, it's kind of important uh, to go through that and just kind of be really mindful of, of your situation, build that forecast, have the cash in the bank. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a great way to look at it. And, and, and by the way, for anyone listening in that's thinking, hey, I already know who's in my industry, hearing about the financial modeling, the dynamic financial modeling, I, I always find stats that if I Google further down would not be available or using you know, mm -hmm. Profit Sense or one of these platforms to be able to tell what February looks like, what it looked like last year and for us and for the space and in multiple industries. And if these events mm -hmm. occur over the next 18 months, the past 18 months, uh, we'll even find, you know, we're talking mergers and acquisitions, uh, you know, EBITDA numbers and multiples that come along with them, you know, for agencies and other groups in mm -hmm. your space specifically. And that yep. could completely shape your decisions. You know, if a million dollar mm -hmm. EBITDA carries a, a 4X multiple and a $5 million EBITDA carries a 10X multiple, and there's variations in between based mm -hmm. on events, it's very, very worthwhile to be able to have these stats and, and, you know, working with folks like Jody, 
working with groups in the M&A space, you're going to have a lot of these things unraveled for you. You're going to mm-hmm. be able to approach discussions differently. So I take a yeah, lot. Of- and I, I would also say, you know, because the, the, one of the big things there is that, you know, a lot of people say, well, hey, I'm going to, you know, they'll, they'll come to us and say, hey, Nate, we need our financials cleaned up because I'm going to sell within six months or whatever. And like, okay, great. Well, how'd you do last year? It's like, well, I had a bad year last year, but I had a great year the year before and a bad year the year before. That. You know, so it's kind of like yo-yoing. It's like, well, you realize you're probably not in the best position to sell. And they're like, why? Because we've got this great forecast. We're going to knock it out of the park. Well, and it's like, well, they don't really care. <laughs> they're looking a lot of times at the historical numbers there and then, then they'll justify maybe a higher multiple if, if they see that it ramping up and you, you got some solid con, contracts in place. And so it, it, it's important to really make sure that every single year follows what you're trying to hit. You know, if you're, if you're trying to build to that, like you said, that million dollars versus the $5 million, if you're trying to get to that $5 million mark, well, don't go from zero to 5 million. You should be trending up towards it. Million, three million, four million. Now you're at five million or six million. That way they can see that hey, this is a steady, you know, steady trend. And also having solid numbers in place and understanding those numbers are really going to be key too, because they're going to wonder why. And if you did have a, a bad year for whatever reason, you really need a story to come back and explain it. It just can't be yeah, we just had a bad year. It's like well, here's what happened. You know, here's the story. Here's what happened. And, and you know, hope that the uh, the buyer um, understands it, believes it. And knows that hey, that's a one one off thing, and it's not going to happen again. You know, so so it's really important to have all that all, all that in place before you, uh, you 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 go market your your, your company. How have things changed here in the I'll call it digital era, but you know, stemming from twenty twenty, a lot of remote business. Uh, you know, in many cases, you, you're essentially consulting a, a, a founder, a manager that you're working with on, on how to run their business. Mm-hmm. Uh, employees, softwares, you know, how that feeds into culture, maybe how that goes into thought leadership uh, or targeting mm-hmm. the right clients and, you know, still getting into content marketing. How have you, think, how have you seen things change from, you know, 06, you know, initial blogs to today in terms of how businesses are run? Yeah, it, it's it's great because um, if I was an accountant, I'd probably be in marketing. That's that's where, that's that's kind of my passion. Uh, thought leadership is something I just love doing, um, and, and that's a big part of it. Um, when we when we started in 06 with just regular regular blogs, nobody did it. I mean, nobody did it. Everybody thought it was a waste of money, it, it, except for the people that really had that. You know, I wish I could say that I had the uh, insight, but it was the only thing I could afford. <laughs> so let's be brutally honest with you on that. Couldn't afford the yellow pages. This was just an alternative way of, of doing it. But with that, you know, just the consistency was the big part of it. You know, it was, you know, because anytime we do a marketing campaign of any kind, it takes about nine months before you actually start seeing any kind of results. And a lot of people give up too quickly. And we, we were guilty of the same thing. You know, I, I can count on my fingers how many marketing programs we did for nine months and didn't didn't get a thing at all. Then like two months later, it's like, oh, got two clients from it. It's like, well, that would have been nice if we had continued on with it. But but the, but the key is just that consistency, putting that that information out there and, and being irrelevant information. And so what what I've seen is you know for us that that was key to our growth. You know that's really the only way we have grown. So we've grown through content marketing, uh, thought leadership, out speaking through videos, social media, all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it is is really how we actually took an accounting firm that was pretty flat um, in growth to something that really spiked up. I'd say the other thing was is that when we niched into the creative agency space, we saw a hockey stick approach, you know, where everything was flat, then all of a sudden, boom, we narrowed our niche, we narrowed our customer base or what we're actually marketing towards, and we got more clients. It's amazing how that how that works, that people seek out specialists in, in different areas. Um, you know, and, 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 and you have to have one niche, you could have multiple niches. We, we niche not only with our product, but we also niched our industry, you know, so we had, we had a double niche going there and, and that really kind of, you know, propelled that growth there. Um, you know, for the, for the folks that, that don't take advantage of that, man, they, they're, they're really missing out. 
you know, we, we meet with a bunch of accounting firms, you know, frequently every quarter. And, um, you know, one of them was so hesitant about spending money in this content marketing because that, because they didn't want to do it. And, you know, they had to hire a, an agency to do it. And it's like, oh, that's going to cost a lot of money. And it's like, oh, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. And, and they, they, they finally started doing it. And they're like, man, that was one of the best investments we ever made. You know, now, now we're not out beating the bush trying to, trying to you know, pick up clients. They're actually calling us. And I'm like, yeah, no kidding. That's how it works. That's the content marketing works. You put the information out there, you put the thought leadership, and then it draws people to, to call you uh, versus you trying to actually, you know, call everybody else. And, and that's how, that's how we've done it. So we've, we, we've not done a single cold call. We've not done any kind of, actually, it's going to be kind of funny. We've never done any outreach email campaigns to, to folks. Everything is completely, uh, you know, in, inbound. And so everybody's, it's coming through us through all that content we stuck out there, which makes it kind of tricky now that we actually merged with Anders. We've got all this content from what, 20 years that now we've got to, you know, we've got to gradually mold so that we don't lose that that visibility because it, we'll find that clients will, or prospects will call us four or five years ago from you know, something they saw four or five years ago. They'll call us about say, hey, I just saw this video. And I'm like, Fairly, what video are you even talking about? <laughs> and then, you know, they're going through, it's like, oh yeah, whatever. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. Or maybe they, they saw me and met me at a conference because I, I speak at a lot of, a lot of events and they're like, you know, Hey, you know, do you remember me from four years ago? I'm like, <laughs> No, unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> but uh, you know, you know, with, with that, you know, that that's the that's kind of the beauty of of content marketing and being that thought leader and really kind of being, you know, giving away the information for free and you know, and, and all the things that belong into it. And I and I say give the information for free. We open our book to everybody. We say, you know, for all of our prospects, we say, here's how you can do it. Here's the key metrics you need to know. Here's how you calculate it. Here's how you actually create that goal forecast. And, you know, just lay it out for them, you know, you know, knowing that one or two are going to actually take that ball, run with it, and they're going to figure it out. And they're going to be your best advocates, period. You know, they, they're like, and, and, and they'll, they'll buy you lunch every time you see them, you help us out, you, you know, all this kind of stuff. Other folks will, will, will fail and try something different. And then those folks, then, then there's other folks that will, will give you a call and, and, you know, say, hey, I need your help on, on getting this done. And so that, that thought leadership is really key there. And the key there is just simply giving it up. Don't be afraid to get open up the book for everybody. And we do the same thing with accounting firms. You know, we we were, we were one of the first firms ever to provide CFO services. Also, at the one of the we were, we were the first uh, financial firm to be fully remote back in early 2010s, you know, 10, but probably around 2013 ish. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of cool to be able to give that or to help other folks, you know, to prevent them from going through the hurdles you went through, you know, and all the mistakes that you made you know, and being that thought leader and kind of helping them along the way. You know, it's very common that we have other accounting firms call say, how do you guys do this? Can you can you share with us how you price? How you how do you market? How do you how do you run a meeting successfully? You know, do you have to have a silver bullet every time? You know, all those different things that. You know, they, they don't know or don't have an idea. You just kind of open the book and help people out. And that and as you raise other people up, it, 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 again, it raises you up. And and I, I'd say that's really the biggest key to, to marketing for us is just being that thought leader, being consistent with the content, making sure it's going out on a regular basis. And the message is very clear. And the message is not a sales approach. The message is 100% education and helping people out. Give. And then that's what creates the inbound over time. Since... Oh, five, oh, six, you guys have been putting out content at first. It, it seemed like a lower cost avenue, but, but really you were putting out what the SEO, what the, what the search engine, mm -hmm. uh, search engines were eating up. And for the keywords, like you said, virtual CFO, very difficult keywords you're ranking for because of the authoritativeness that the search engines are reading from your platform. The content, I imagine you guys have some, some groups that, you know, you've mm -hmm. talked about or posted what you're doing that are authoritative it showed that type of relevancy so over time it's it's really helped position you as a thought leader and so impressive to hear that it's all inbound imagine the quality uh, of the groups that you speak to is is very high being in mm -hmm. they know jody they want to speak with you guys love what you said here can we talk further uh, imagine a lot of that is at play and it's great that you're able to provide uh these different shortcuts, cheat codes, if you will, mm -hmm. towards remote work, towards content creation, towards the formation of these digital environments to be able to target the right audiences and bring them into the model. 
you know, not just come on board as, uh, you know, a CPA who's saying, yeah, got to get the numbers up, uh, expenses right. up at these levels as much as here's what we're seeing. Here's where we can go. And based on what we've done firsthand, you can actually apply this to directly into your model. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly right. Now, what type of recommendations would you have for founders that are listening in and want to test some, some things out for themselves or for their own model? This could be in regards to marketing. This could be in regards to, you know, how they're structuring out their financial model. I mean, you've already given so many great tips with, you know, have 10 to 30% here, look mm -hmm. at 18 months, look at comparables in your industry. You've already given so much, uh, but, you know, just as part of the nature of the show, test stop. Yeah, yeah. What are some tests, uh, some actual insights that listeners can take? Yeah, the, the biggest thing, and I find what holds a lot of people back is that that they uh, that they're content with not taking risks. You know, change is is one of those really tough things that people just tend not to, to enjoy. You know, and for entrepreneurs, change isn't as hard. You know, because we're entrepreneurs, we like to do things a little differently. But you, you can kind of guess it, it is hard for a lot of folks. And, and so I, I would say. Change for change sake is not a good thing, but but be open to looking at different ways of doing things. Be open to, you know, the, the opportunity outside of that box. You know, it, when we started um, Summit back, you know, in 2002, we, a traditional accounting firm, it was just two, two dudes. Uh, and we didn't have a staff. We answered the calls ourselves. You know, we were, were knocking on doors. We were doing everything we could to, to actually, you know, start this new practice out. And if it wasn't for us thinking outside the box, you know, thinking about, hey, this obstacle hit us right in the face, can't afford to pay money in the yellow pages. So how else can we generate things? Well, let's try this avenue, spend some money into this internet thing and it just happen to work out well. Now there's 10 different things we spent money on that didn't work, uh, but that's cool because it did, it, did, it did take me to that one thing that did. And, and as we went through subscription-based modeling was another thing, you know, when, when, you know, it came to the point where I, I can't afford to be the bank, you know, I don't have the, the deep cash, you know, when, when, you know, I, I hate chasing people down. Can you imagine going to a cash flow meeting where you're telling people, Hey, you know, you, you're going to be light over the next three weeks. Oh, by the way, my bills due tomorrow, <laughs> you know, kind of a tough discussion to have. And, and our CFOs were put in a bad position. And then we'd have clients not showing up for meetings because we were, they are behind on payments. And, and, and it's like, well, you need to be there because we need to help you out, you know, that you need to get through that area. And so how did we overcome with it? We came up with a subscription-based billing model. We thought, well, hey, let's give them some unlimited service and let's create it so that they're paying a same flat fee every month. Let's not invoice them. You know, let's just simply zap their accounts. And that monthly fee ended up being ended up going to a weekly fee and, and it was like all well, the the clients really loved it because it was automated and it was easy and it was they, they knew what to expect and it was overcoming all these different obstacles but it but it was because of the fact that we had an issue with the bank <laughs> we didn't want to be the bank anymore we didn't want to have all this ar how can we how can we overcome that how can we think outside the box to overcome it. Software companies do this all the time. This is this is a regular thing for software companies. You know, hey, you know, when, when you're developing coding and stuff, you know, hey, you want somebody to go from here to here. Well, you you kind of figure you, you make that you know, the situation to, to you know you change the code so that it goes from here to here. Same thing with with a business. You're, you're running a business. You want to you're going to hit obstacles all along the way. The distributed model was another thing. You know, we we saw a client that was doing it. Thought this was great. We were having so much problems recruiting in our area of 300,000 people with the growth. We thought, hey, how, how, without poaching people all the time, how can we actually get more people? Well, we could do this remote thing and just hire all across the United States. How is that going to work? Well, we, we did it and boom, now that solved an issue. So we, we took the leap of faith, got rid of the office, and then we started in you know, 2013 you know, hiring people all across the United States. And all of a sudden, we're picking clients up everywhere, not just in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's kind of funny. We're, we're based out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. We have the least amount of clients in Fort Wayne than anywhere else in the United States, you know, because of the remote, you know, because the, the world just kind of opened up for us back in 13. And it did the same thing with the pandemic. It opened up for everyone there too. But it took that force thing for the for, for people to actually to look at it. And so, you know, you know, when I when I did speaking engagements with accounting firms, you know, you know, five, six years ago, we would talk about how, the, how it's great, how we're doing the CFO service, how we're helping clients grow and all this kind of stuff and how we're doing it with the remote team. And they're all over the United States and people would just come in herds to, to hear us talk about it. We'd, we'd be at a show and we'd have by far the most people listening in our talk. And then one after another would say, man, that's really cool, cool model there. But 
we could never do that. And we could never do that. And, and they give me five different reasons why they couldn't do it. And it was like, it was like one afternoon. It was like, it was like Groundhog Day again. It was like, Jesus Christ, doesn't everybody, you know, won't you take that risk? And, and it's because people just feel comfortable with what they're doing, especially if things are going well. And, and so what I would challenge you to do is that I don't care how well things are going. If, if, if you can look for a different way of doing it, a better way of doing it, it's going to, it's going to solve an issue for you or your company or, or your clients, you know, don't hesitate look through it and, and then take the, take the leap of faith, you know, don't, uh, don't just jump off a bridge for the, for, you know, without looking down and see what's down there, but, uh, you know, you know, take that opportunity and take that risk. Some people spend more time defending the old way of doing things versus trying out the new and your story. I mean, it, it has stood the test of time. Hey, we're, we're, we're testing out this model. Other companies don't even want to touch it. They like it, but they, they can't roll it out themselves. Now we're able to grow and they're fighting for, you know, the new market share. But, yeah. but I have to ask, what if uh, it doesn't work? Obviously it did wonders for you guys. Mm -hmm. Not all startups work. The percentages the first mm -hmm. year, great. Second year for five years, uh, maybe even ongoing after that. What are the best ways to optimize, you know, tweak it, to manage it to a point of effectiveness in your perspective? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a great question because you know th there are several things. You know, it, it was kind of funny for for me. It wasn't funny for my wife. You know, every year I'd say, "Hey, next year is going to be the year," and here's why. <laughs> <laughs> you know, next year it happened. All these things would go wrong, and I'd be like, hey, "Next year, honey, <laughs> it's going to be the year." Um, that happened. That was like year over year over year over year. And you know, the, it, it's just one of those things. It's just resiliency, really. I mean, it's. It, it, it's you, you've got to put you got to put that place together. You got to put yourself in a position that if you do fail, it, it doesn't kill you. It doesn't you know take you completely out. Um, a lot of times that can't be prevented. But uh, you know, for 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 a lot of people, you know, hey, you got to build that cash value. Cash is king. Protect your business. Protect it like you, you couldn't you know like. You, but then also take take enough risk that you can actually you know, overcome a lot of that stuff. And so, you know, it, it was year over year over year of fail, fail, fail. And, and I, I would say fail. We, we, when I, when I say fail, there was years I didn't make any money at all. You know, it's kind of, kind of weird. You, you're running an accounting firm and you're talking to people how to, how to be profitable and here you're failing so much that you, you, your salary is, you know, far, far, far less than what, what your clients are. And it's like, you know, and, and that, and that's fine. You know, I didn't let my pride get in, into the way. It's like, Hey, I'm going to figure this out. And so it was just constantly having that optimistic attitude that, Hey, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure this out. And when I did figure it out, it was like, Oh, this is pretty cool. And, and from there on, it was a great story that I could then tell our clients, you know, they, yeah, it, you know, I, I could sit in your shoes. I've been in your shoes before. I know how it feels. Let's figure out how we can get out of that. And here's what I did. Here's how we can do it. And, and here's the, uh, the map, I guess, yeah. and then kind of help them through that venture. People always want to talk about the success stories and not about the process to get there. I'm sure your wife's very happy now. And I, I, you know, personally gone through, you know, th those years where, you know, you're looking more at the light at the end of the tunnel than the bank mm -hmm. account, uh, yep. but it all works out and, and it's those processes that get there. And that's what we look to you know, discuss here on the show. That being said, I, I do want to talk about success stories in terms of scale. The distributed subscription model is working. Whatever mm -hmm. founders are testing out, it, it's now happening. Yep. What are the best ways to take that for larger percentages of, uh, of market share? Any success stories or examples are great. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, as we begin to wrap up and get to final yeah. thought here as well too, what are some of the, uh, the best tips towards scale? Yeah, you know, the, the one thing we didn't talk a ton about it is niching. And and I, I truly, we did give it about five, 10 minutes, but really niching is the key, in my opinion, on how if you want to really scale, uh, niche a service, and then also niche an industry. So you have, you always have, you always have two niches you're looking at. So we could be an accounting firm that does everything for everybody. And, and we're going to grow at a nice 5% rate. And if you're happy with that, then great. But that wasn't our that wasn't our dream. That wasn't what we wanted to do. We wanted to grow that. We wanted to be that twenty million dollar company. How are we going to get there? And so it's like, well, we, we had to kind of figure out, hey, this, this virtual CFO niche that's working for us really well. Let's keep doing that. Let's add on to it. And then we thought, you know, how can we go faster? And so we thought, hey, you know, what if we can do this with audits? You know, we're an, we're an accounting firm. Why couldn't we do this audits? And so we we thought we'd add a four hundred one k audit line to it. So again, a super niched audit. 
401k audit, the only type of audit that we did. And we thought, hey, can we, can we actually do this? And we started off with one, then we started with five, then it was 10. Then we were doing 200 when we sold the, the firm in, in, you know, last year. So we did about 150 to 200 audits at, you know, from 401k audits from zero to that because we focused strictly on that. We content marketing strictly to that. And for the longest time, you did 401k audit and boom, we were, you know, right up there in the, uh, in the top one, two or three. And we had those processes down. We had everything geared towards that 401k audit. And so the, the niching is, is the key there. And so now what, what other niches are we going to do? Well, we're thinking transportation, trucking. We're thinking logistics. We're thinking cannabis might be a great niche. Maybe construction is a great niche, healthcare. So we're, we're looking at other niches that we can then focus on and really market to have a really solid knowledge of it. Now, that doesn't mean that we... You know, a lot of people think, you know, a niche is because you have a high concentration of the client base. And that's not, that's, to me, that's not a niche. That's just simply, you have a high concentration of the client base. A niche is when you really focus towards it, you market to it, you educate to it, and you become that thought leader in that client base. That's a true niche. And so if you can become that, then, and you can really drive that, man, that's going to really, that, that'll exponentiate your growth uh, big time. And that that's one of our key key things to going from 10 million to 50 million. Cause by ourselves, I think we could do it 10 million to 20 million pretty easily. Cause we've always doubled our, our size every three years. It's, it's going to happen just because we've got the, uh, the flywheel going there, but to really throw gas on. And I think that's where the other niches are really going to help us kind of get to that next level. So if we can be really solid with three or four niches and having, having a vertical, man, that, that, that to me is how, how you, how you really grow. There's riches in the niches we've heard. We've heard a lot of niche sayings as it's part of our DNA, mm -hmm. digital niche agency name. But it, it, it's, it's profound, right? To, to take on more, you actually want to narrow and take mm -hmm. on less. And yeah. then you can go after additional niche, niches, niches yeah. and continue to scale and scale and scale from there. Mm -hmm. but without that special, specialization, we're just another marketing agency, yep. another you know, accounting firm, but being able to say, no, no, this agencies, uh, you know, these types of, of startups, uh, subscription model, 401k audit, that, that's where you can really be looked at as the go-to group and take on far more volume. 100% agree. You know, and, and it's kind of, kind of neat because we've got a marketing agency that deals only with HVAC clients. That's it. And they make but buku bucks. They, they're, because they are known for that. People seek them out because of that. And, uh, you know, they're all across the United States, you know, no different than our clients. You know, it's kind of funny because our clients will call us and they'll say, you know, hey, you know, we're spending $10,000 on our, our CPA. I know yours is like 80000 so it's a little more expensive or a lot more expensive. But you know what? Um, we're going to go with you because you understand us. You understand our niche, you understand our industry. And it's like that that's that's really the key. You know, could that other sir, other accountant provide uh, as, as good a service? Well, maybe, maybe not, but that's kind of what we do. And that's why people would come to us and no, no different than what you're talking about. You know, if, if that's what you do, that's why people come to you and that's why they're going to spend a little bit more money because they know they're going to get a better, better uh, experience. Well, Jody, you are a wealth of information here and want to recommend that listeners, if they see there to be a fit, reach out to, to you reach out to some of virtual CFO by Anders. What, what's the best way for them to get in contact and, and any final notes you want to leave listeners with? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I guess the best way to contact us is just reach out on our website. It's a uh, summit S U M M I T C P A dot net. It's dot net. Cause I couldn't afford dot com. <laughs> so dot net. And uh, you know, with that, uh, feel free to, to there, there's a lot of different ways you can get hold me there, or you can just simply drop me an email at jody at summitcpa.net. So J-O-D-Y at summitcpa.net. Either one's fine. I'm on LinkedIn. I mean, really anywhere, YouTube channels, you, you name it. You can it, just Google me. It's pretty pretty easy to find me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jody, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to podcast with us today. Uh, sure going to get a, a lot of notes from listeners. I know I've taken two pages of notes myself. <laughs> the team. And I uh, want to you know, thank everybody for tuning in here as well. Uh, we'll see everybody next time.